For part two, we're gonna start talking a little bit about seizures and epilepsy treatment. How do we diagnose these seizures in epilepsy? How do we treat them? What are side effects of the treatments? And what's the prognosis of seizures in epilepsy? As a brief refresher to the prior section, the brain is made up of millions of connections between individual brain cells that we call neurons. Each one of the small lights over here in the brain represents the constant electrical activity that's occurring in the brain during every second to sense the environment around us, produce our movements, make sounds, and communicate. There needs to be a constant balance between those signals that are exciting brain messages and those that prevent or inhibit brain messages. When there is imbalance, this is when trouble can arise and a seizure can occur. Importantly, seizures themselves are not the disease. Instead, they are merely a symptom of many different disorders that can affect the brain. Epilepsy is a seizure disorder that is characterized by recurring seizures, not otherwise provoked by acute injury or a health emergency. The causes of epilepsy are diverse, including stroke, tumor, infection, injury, metabolic problems, or genetic problems. Epilepsy is extremely common with over 150,000 new cases annually and over 3 million Americans affected with epilepsy of varying ages. The diagnosis of a seizure is typically based on the clinical history provided by a witness of a concerning episode. For example, if a patient is accompanied by a parent and the parent explains to me that they were acting totally themselves, they were at their baseline, then all of a sudden they fell to the ground, started shaking their entire body, they bit their lip, they drooled at the mouth, they had their eyes turned to one side and then closed, and then it was followed by a slow stopping of the shaking and acting very sleepy. This would be a story extremely concerning for a seizure to me. As a neurologist, if a story is suspicious for a seizure or a videotape that you take of an episode, the first step is a test called an electroencephalogram, or EEG. This is a test to measure brain activity by placing small sensors all over the scalp. The sensors are not painful, but the glue used to adhere them to the scalp may be a little bit stinky. Once the sensors are in place, a computer will generate a visual representation of the brain waves over different parts of the head. There are some key things to know about EEG. Depending on your location, the availability of EEG technology might be limited. You may have a routine EEG, which lasts less than an hour, or you might be admitted to a local hospital for overnight video EEG monitoring. In some places, the EEG can actually be connected and you go home with the wires in a small backpack to gather the data for review. You can even take it home for up to three days at some times. While it would be useful to have a concerning episode while you're on the EEG machine, it's not a waste of time to obtain the EEG data not having an episode. The basic EEG can provide information about how active the brain is when a person is awake and asleep. This can be just as useful and even predictive of whether a person is at risk for seizures in the future. It's also important to remember that since the sensors are placed on the outside of the scalp, an abnormal brain activity must be large enough and powerful enough to reach the surface. If the seizure activity is too small or too weak or too deep within the brain, you may not be able to see it on the EEG itself. So just because we say we can't see on an EEG doesn't mean it's not a seizure. And most importantly, the EEG is a tool, merely a tool that a clinician will use for evaluations. It is not the only way to determine whether a patient actually has seizures, epilepsy, or needs medication. This needs to be determined between a patient and their doctor. As an example, on the left, each one of these little computer readouts represents a brainwave between two sensors on the brain. This is an example of a nice, 
awake, adult EEG. On the right, you can see a big difference. Lots of large, black, thick lines going all over. This is when there's increased electrical activity that causes the arms and the legs to convulse and make the EEG look like this. Sometimes when a person is having an EEG, the technologist who will place all of the sensors and collect the information may ask an individual to do some activities that might provoke seizure activity on the EEG. These include hyperventilation, photic stimulation, and sleep deprivation. Hyperventilation, such as blowing a, a pinwheel, induces a relative decreased blood flow to the brain and decreased sugar utilization. This activation procedure will involve asking the person to breathe very deeply and exhale for three minutes. It can be very useful for provoking absence staring episodes in children. The middle picture here, and see the little girl laying on the bed with each of the EEG leads in place. The woman up here has a photic stimulator. She's shining strobe lights lasting five to 10 second frequencies between one and 35 Hertz. This is very particular response to the vision part of the brain. This is expected with this procedure. Anything abnormal might suggest some disease in the vision part of the brain. Sometimes seizures are particularly responsive to these bright strobe lights that are flashing. And very often sleep deprivation does provoke some abnormal brain activity and seizures. In the hospital, we often will ask children to stay up much later than usual to see if there's any more abnormal brain activity. The treatment of seizures should be under the care of an experienced physician, such as a neurologist or a practitioner who has experience in managing seizures. In general, we recommend healthy lifestyle choices, including a good night's rest, healthy eating, and avoiding drugs and excessive alcohol. Practitioners will need to determine the risk of an individual to have another seizure and whether there may be a benefit of a medication that would outweigh any risks of the medication for risk of more seizures. Other options that I'll briefly touch upon are diets, surgeries, and neuromodulation. Parents often ask, my, my child, has a seizure disorder, or they're at risk for having seizures. What do I do? How do I keep them safe? This is the rule of P's. Prevent seizures by taking their prescribed medications regularly. Timing is very important. You need to take a medication when your doctor instructs you to. Skipping medications is one of the top causes of breakthrough seizures. Some people have known triggers for their seizures, such as illnesses, fever, or sleep deprivation. These would increase the risk of having a seizure. So be aware of any of your potential triggers. Number two, pause and ask yourself, if my child had a seizure right now doing this activity, would they get hurt? For example, if my child's climbing on a rope above their head in gym class, suspended on a monkey bar or swimming by themselves, these are all situations that would clearly be dangerous for someone who had a seizure. Therefore, I would advise against those types of activities. A child can take a bath, they can take a shower, but they should have somebody monitoring them at all times. Safety is key. Third, planning. You must have a seizure action plan in case something does happen. This puts you in control of the situation with a plan. Anyone who has had a seizure can and should have a seizure action plan. This plan should accompany the individual to school, work, or wherever they are with people who may not know their medical history. If something happens to them, the plan should be easily available and informative of the types of seizures a person has, the medication that they take every day, contact information, and an emergency medication plan. You should work with your prescribing physician to make a seizure action plan. Find free examples online, epilepsy.com and other similar websites.
I'm going to briefly discuss some of the medications used for seizures. The number of medications for seizures has rapidly expanded over the last few decades, but the two main differences between seizure medications are a group of medications that are abortive or emergency medications to give at the time of a seizure or daily preventative medications to prevent seizures from happening. The group of medications that are commonly used as abortive medications are a class of medications known as benzodiazepines. Here are a few names that you may commonly see. Diazepam or diastat, lorazepam or ativan, clonazepam, clonopin, or midazolam, versed. In general, these types of medications act by shutting down the electrical signals all over the brain. They are to be used for prolonged seizures, usually seizures lasting greater than three or five minutes. They can be administered in many fashions, rectally, orally, intramuscular, or intravenous. Because they do have this effect of shutting down the electrical activity all over the brain, common side effects include being extremely sleepy, slowing down their breathing, and slowing down their heart rate. On the right is the medication called diastat, which is a commonly prescribed rectal medicine that can be used for children and adults that have seizures when they are prolonged. As opposed to an abortive treatment, when you give a medication only at the time of a seizure, a preventative medication is one that you take every day to prevent seizures. They are, there are different ones for different seizure types. Some are used for more partial seizures, such as oxcarbazepine or carbamazepine, whereas others are more broadly used, such as levetiracetam, valproic acid, phenobarbital, zanisamide, or tapiramate, among others. Most medications have some side effects, so it's important to discuss the potential side effects of each specific medication. The mechanism of actions of anti-epileptic seizure drugs or anti-seizure drugs act by very different mechanisms. Mostly, they're involved with that modulation of the channels and chemical transmission across the brain. For example, here's a very complex picture, but again, this is that nerve cell transmitting information from one cell to another cell. Each one of these medications circled inhibit different or block different parts of this chemical pathway. That's how these different medications act in different means. This is how different anti-epileptic medications can present, prevent seizures. The classic ketogenic diet is a special high fat, low carbohydrate diet that has been sometimes shown to help control seizures. Doctors usually recommend the ketogenic diet, or keto, for children who have seizures related to specific metabolic disorders, one being GLUT1 disorder, or glucose transporter 1 disorder, and two being pyruvate dehydrogenase deficiency. A third group of individuals, those who have very hard to control seizures, or medically refractory epilepsy, can also consider using the ketogenic diet. This classic diet, called the long-chain triglyceride diet, provides three to four grams of fat for every one gram of carbohydrate and protein. It's important to note, there are side effects even to diets. Side effects can include pancreatitis, kidney stones, high cholesterol levels, constipation, slowed growth, and bone fractures. Due to the risks of this diet, an individual must have this plan prescribed by a physician and carefully monitored by a dietitian. Epilepsy surgery. It sounds pretty scary to say that you would go for brain surgery when you just have seizures, but it's actually a pretty safe alternative for some people whose seizures cannot be controlled by medications. The benefits of surgery can be weighed carefully against the risk. There's no guarantee it will be successful in controlling seizures. However, in people with partial epilepsy, 
who have extremely difficult to control seizures that have not responded to aggressive treatment with medication, it really should be considered. More recently, surgery is being considered sooner with better outcomes. For example, if a patient tries just two medications or a combination of two medications, and it's only been a year or two, they should consider surgery if they're still having breakthrough seizures. Epilepsy surgery can be especially helpful to people who have had seizures from structural brain problems, such as a small brain tumor, a small stroke, or even malformations of blood vessels. Another category of a seizure treatment is known as neuromodulation. This is also known as neurostimulation. Scientists don't exactly understand the nuances of it, but basically there seems to be some interruption in the pain signals that, is, that are carried from the nerves up to the brain. The top figure is what we call a vagal nerve stimulator. There's a pacemaker device called a generator that's placed under the skin in the chest that's connected to a flexible wire and it leads to this nerve called the vagus nerve. It's this vagus nerve that sends information to the brain and sometimes seem to have a positive effect on slowing down seizures. The bottom picture is a newer device called an RNS or responsive neurostimulation. This is implanted under the scalp and actually takes real time information from the brain. As abnormal brain activity is noted, there will actually be a response to this, to this electrical activity to dampen it down and prevent seizures. I'm only gonna spend one slide on this, but medical marijuana is being sought as a treatment for many medical purposes, including seizures and epilepsy. A number of states in the United States have laws allowing cannabis to be recommended and dispensed for multiple medical reasons. However, the jury is still out on whether this treatment is always helpful or harmful to seizures. Importantly, we don't completely understand what effects medical marijuana has on the developing brain. There's some evidence that cannabis can be helpful in controlling seizures that are very difficult to control, like Lennox-Gastaut syndrome and Dravet syndrome, these are very devastating neurological disorders that can be very hard to control with seizures. It's important to remember that marijuana or cannabis has a number of side effects. In open labeled studies on this, side effects included sleepiness, diarrhea, fatigue, and decreased appetite. And very importantly, this type of medical marijuana can interact with different med epilepsy medications, making it very difficult to control the amount of medications in the body while treating epilepsy. The prognosis of what happens when a person has seizures and epilepsy really depends on why they had the seizure in the first place. Remember, the only reason somebody has a seizure is because something was going on with the brain underneath. There's a much better prognosis for a seizure that's caused by an acute injury such as meningitis as opposed to a developmental brain problem. For example, the brain not forming correctly. Genetic identification and classification, such as what we have been brought here today through Simon's VIP, may provide some clues as to prognosis. But there are also other risk factors that predict worse outcome. Having other neurological diagnoses, such as developmental delay or cognitive impairment. Neuropsychological testing is often sought to characterize the strengths, the weaknesses, the adaptive and cognitive abilities of an individual. It's important to remember as a pediatrician and a neurologist that a child with epilepsy is a whole patient. They have a family, they have medications, the school that they go to, the friends that they have, and the lifestyle changes that might accompany them with this new diagnosis. It's important to take all this into account when treating an individual with epilepsy. Please remember, you are not alone. There are many different foundations out there for those with epilepsy, those with seizure, and those with special children. Thank you and have a nice night.